What does Jesus say about causing a child to sin? In this day, in this age, there are a lot of things that cause children to sin. There's a lot of things on TV that's promoted. Sexual sin, sexual immorality. I mean, let's line everything up to the commandments of God. God gave us commandments. He gave us rules to go by. And it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, that anything that transgresses the law of God, anything that goes against the law of God, is a sin. Is it possible to live without sin? Absolutely. Luke chapter 1, verse 6, the parents of John the Baptist, it says they both lived blamelessly. In other words, you couldn't blame them for any sin whatsoever. And they obeyed all the commandments of God. You see, God is not a tyrant, an abuse of God that just barks out commandments that he knows his people cannot obey. No, he gave us lots of of commandments, but he also gave us the ability to obey it. It says also in the scriptures that he, that we will not be tempted beyond that which we can bear. In other words, you are not going to be tempted to the point where you can you have to give in to that temptation. So it's it it, it is possible to live sinless. Now, does that mean we are perfect in the eyes of men? No. We will never be perfect in the eyes of men. When someone's looking for some kind of dirt on you, they'll always be able to find something on you. You say, oh, well, you didn't say this word correctly. Well, you made a spelling mistake here. Well, you tripped when you were going up the stairs. All of those things may be imperfections, but they are not sin. Okay, so you got to define what sin is. It's possible and very possible to be an imperfect human being and also be a sinless human being in the light and according to the standard of the law of God. Okay? God said very clearly in Deuteronomy chapter 30, after all the commandments were brought down through Moses, you know, what they say was 613 commandments in the Torah, near the end of the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 30, God made it very clear, these commandments are not too hard for you to obey. In other words, you got no excuse. You can obey them. Now, Today, in in many parts of the world, you know, you cannot really obey all the commandments because some of the commandments require things that we don't have today. Let's say a temple. Uh, and, you know, these kind of things that the commandments uh, say, you know, you know, you're supposed to go to the temple this time of year, whatever. Well, we don't have a working temple, at, you know, in, in this day and age. So, uh, so yeah, there are commandments that literally, you know, if you want to be very legalistic about it, there are, there are commandments that you, can, you cannot, absolutely impossible, that you cannot obey. But if you know the spirit of the Torah and the entire, uh, you know, the entire uh, heart of the Torah and what God says in his commandments, uh, he says, you don't, you are not obligated to obey the commands that you cannot obey. You know, for example, when it comes to tithes and offerings, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, it says, you know, if the place, you know, again, there's a designated place to take the tithes and offering, offerings. If those tithes and offerings, if that place is too far for you to travel, it basically says, you know, you take your tithes, you take your offerings, which are animal sacrifices, by the way, and you would take them and you would sell them and you would use the money for other things, okay? You would use the money in a different way, okay? So there are provisions in the Torah for different um, situations that arise where you cannot obey a certain command. So no, it's not too hard to obey. The commandments of God are not too hard. They are not burdensome, as it says in in, in John, okay? Uh, John said in his in epistles that the, the commandments of, are, are not burdensome. And that means the commandments of God, obviously. The commandments of God are eternal because God is eternal. And the commandments of God are a reflection of God's character and his ways, which are eternal. So, having said that, is it possible to live sinless? Absolutely. So don't go on to say, well, you know, everything, everybody has some sin and it's impossible to cause, you know, to, to, uh, to raise children in this, in this day and age, or it's impossible to be around children or influence children without influencing them to sin one way or another. That is not true. It is possible 
to influence them to be sinless, okay? There are a lot of influences out there, again, through the internet, through, the, through television especially, especially through a lot of this modern music that's around today. Music, um, television, and internet, there's a lot of influence out there that is evil. No doubt about it. So the question is, is this particular thing that they are promoting, that they are trying to get you to accept these days, is this particular thing that they are trying to get you to accept, is it sin or is it not sin? If it says in the Bible not to do it anywhere, if it says not to do it, that means it's sin. If it says that this particular lifestyle or this particular action is forbidden, that means if you do it, it's sin, okay? And so if you put a child in front of a television that 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 softens or, what should I say, that numbs that child to that sin, then that is a big problem, okay? God is a God of conviction. He wants you to know what sin is, what sin is not. He wants you to know what righteousness is. Jesus said when the Spirit of God comes, you know, so many people today claim to have the Spirit of God. Almost every church claimed to go, you know, have the Spirit of God. And almost every Christian leader claims to be led by the Spirit of God. But you cannot be led by the Spirit of God and also transgress the law of God, which was given by the Spirit of God, the eternal Spirit of God, by the way. There are people who think that the law is fleshly and works. It's got to do with works, whereas that the Spirit has got to do with just faith and grace. Not so whatsoever. The, this law, as Paul said, the law is spiritual, is spiritual, is holy, is just, is good. You know, so anything that comes against that is not good, not holy, not just, and not spiritual. Because a lot of sin has just got to do with your own selfish desires or fleshly desires, okay? So let's see what Jesus said about causing a child to sin. We're reading from Luke chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Let's read it. He said to the disciples, It is impossible that no occasions of stumbling should come. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. Stumbling in the scriptures refers to sin. When you're walking with God and you stumble, that means you sin, okay? That you're stumbling in your walk with God. So Jesus said it's impossible that no occasions for stumbling should come. In other words, temptations will be there. There will always be uh, the ability to sin. There will always be an occasion to sin. There will always be an occasion you know, an occasion for stumbling. Let's read on. But woe, okay, woe is a cursing, okay? Jesus, it's not blessing. Jesus said woe. He calls down woe upon him through whom they come, through whom sin and, and the occasions of stumbling come. So Jesus said right here, it is impossible that no occasion for stumbling should come. In other words, there always be, will be occasions for stumbling to come. There always will be things in your path, okay, to stumble on. But woe to him through whom they come. The person, there's always a person involved that influences somebody to sin, okay? Woe to that person. Woe is the opposite of blessing. It is a curse. Curse, cursed. You will be cursed if, or you are cursed, if you are a vessel through whom sin comes. Let's read verse 2. It would be better for him if a millstone, that's a large, heavy stone, by the way, were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, then he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. Very, very serious thing that Jesus is saying here. And this is why I'm taking a whole teaching on this alone. You know, just two verses. It is a very serious thing that Jesus is talking about here. He said, you know, there always will be occasions to sin. But woe, woe, curse, you know, cursing upon those 
through whom sin comes. Television producers, movie producers, musicians, companies that are all involved in this kind of stuff that I'm sure that a lot of them claim to be Christians probably. And so they justify it some way or another by grace, love, or faith, or something to that effect. But Jesus said, we're going by the words in red. We are going by the words of the Lord himself. He said, woe to those whom, through whom sin comes. And then he goes on even further to say it would be better for him, that is for someone through, him, through whom sin comes, it would be better for that person to hang a huge stone around their neck and for them to basically commit suicide than to cause a child to sin. That is a very, very serious rebuke, warning. <laughs> what can I say? That is a very, very serious thing to say to every one of us that is in any way in contact with children. There are a lot of things in this world that are committed, that are considered sin. A lot of things are considered sin. And people, especially a lot of Christians, like to just write it off. Well, well we just all, we, you know, there's nobody's perfect. Oh, we all sin. You know, oh, well, you know, that's not a bad sin. That's not as bad as murder or something like that. Let's call a spade a spade. If Jesus said it's wrong, it's wrong. If God the Father said through Moshe, through Moses, that it is wrong, it is sin, then it's sin. It doesn't matter whether he said it 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, or today. It's all the same. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Remember in Malachi, he said, I am the Lord, I change not. And because he does, does not change, well, by the way, he doesn't change because he doesn't make a mistake. He doesn't change. That's the reason why you can trust in him. If he changes and changes and changes, you won't be able to trust him. No. He said thousands of years ago, to Moses, this is eternal, this is eternal, this is eternal. He said through David, this is eternal. In fact, just in the Torah itself, it says that in different aspects of the Torah, different contexts and different commandments, different precepts, different ordinances, different covenants are eternal, everlasting, forever, without end. That flies in the face of modern day Christianity, especially the Christianity that teaches that, oh, well, the law is gone now. If the law is gone, God is gone because God is a reflection, or I should say the law is a reflection of God. The law is the law because it is the ways of God. It is the character of God. The law says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal. Okay? That's because God, that's the way God is. That is his character. Okay? Okay? So, there are many different interpretations of the law. There are many different ways of looking at it. We're going to get into that as well because I've had, you know, people say to me, well, you know, how can the law say, well, for example, you should not murder, but then God said go out and kill all kinds of different nations and thousands of people and then he gave them trouble because they didn't, because he didn't, because his people didn't obey his command to kill them. You got to understand there's a difference between wartime, peacetime. There's a difference between killing and murdering. Killing in wartime is uh, accepted, I think, in every, almost e even today, in every country of this world. There is a time to kill. Um, there are circumstances that arise where you have to kill. Uh, but murdering is different. That is when you come against your own kinsmen, your own citizens, the, 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 the people with whom you belong. Okay? Okay. Uh, that's different. That's, that's personal grudges that you've got against people, which is completely against the law of God, okay? That's completely against the law of God. Now, I'm not going to go in, I didn't mean for this video or this teaching to be uh, talking about uh, murdering and this kind of stuff, but there are lots of different sins, especially sexual sins, you know? 
and w- other different sins, witchcraft, occult, um, lying, um, you know, all kinds of different things. Read the, read the scriptures. Go through it. Go through the book of Leviticus, you know, and, and tick off all of the different things that it applies today. A lot of it does. We need to be very careful when we put our children down in front of a television. They're not watching things that are going to numb their conscience to sin. What I mean by that is they'll get used to it. They'll, they will accept it as alternative. Or, you know, oh, these people are just nice. You know, these sinners, they're good. They're cool. They're, they're the end thing. Not with God they are not. We read earlier how Jesus said, the things that are loved by the world are hated by God. The things that are hated by the world are loved of God. When you decide, when you are drawn into the fold and you become a real, true follower of Yeshua, of Jesus, you will accept, you have to accept things that the world hates. You have to become somebody that the world hates because Jesus himself said that a teacher is not greater than the student. A master is not greater than the servant. If you're fully taught, if you you are fully trained by a master or a teacher, you are just like your teacher. Okay? Jesus said, if the world hates me, and he said the world hates me. He actually, in fact, he said it in the book of John, and we're going to get to that in the next book. He said, the world hates me because I testify that its deeds are evil. Does your pastor testify that the world's deeds are evil? Or does he get up there every Sunday morning and and teach some nice little pretty ear, ear tickling sermon? Does your bishop, does your priest testify that the world is evil and identify, define, identify sin where it needs to be defined and identified and, by the way, rejected? Does he do that? If not, he's not. He's not a good example of a Christian, of someone who's following Christ, of someone who is doing what Jesus would do. WWJD, what would Jesus do? He would define, identify sin and reject it, call for people to repent of it. That's what he did. He said, I don't come for the righteous, but I come for sinners to call them to repentance. If you want to be like Jesus, you got to do that. But don't forget, do not forget, it is a serious thing to cause a child to sin. I'm not causing my child to sin. I'm, you know, they're watching some videos and watching some music videos and listening to music. But I know the music it doesn't, you know, it promotes things that, that God doesn't necessarily like, but it's okay. It's just music. It's just a video game. Well, it's just a movie. No, it's not. It's a subtle infiltration of the devil to numb your child's conscience of what's really evil. Your child needs to feel good when things are good according to God. Your child needs to feel shame when he does something wrong, when there is a sin that he is committing according to the law of God. It's very simple, my friend. If what your children are listening to and watching or being taught in school. If what they're being taught in school is actually taking away the shame of sin, that is absolutely demonic, evil to the core. Jesus said that those people, the teachers, the musicians, the movie producers, whoever, even parents, some parents, It would be better for them to commit suicide than for them to cause a child to sin in the eyes of God. There are many people who are listening to this video, many people who are listening to this teaching who need to repent 
When I, what do I mean by repent? I don't mean just feel sorry. No, God's not looking for just someone who's just feeling sorry about it. He's looking for change. He's looking for you to take action and change. Does that mean pulling your children out of public school? Amen. Does that mean turning off secular TV? Amen. Does that mean throwing out secular music? Amen. Does that mean getting rid of secular magazines? Amen. Whatever it takes, raise the child in the way that he or she should go. And in the end, that child will not depart from it. It's my prayer that every one of you as parents and every one of you that are in contact with with children would be involved in influencing that child or those children into righteousness. It's possible. It's very possible. And as it says in the book of Daniel chapter 12, if you lead people to righteousness in the, you know, in the age to come, in the day of the Lord, you will shine like the sun. You will be like the stars of the sky, the true stars, not the stars you, t- you see on TV. A true star. You will shine like a star in the kingdom of God, in the everlasting kingdom of God, because you lead many to righteousness. So may God give you strength. May God give you courage to turn from sin and to pull your child out from the pit of hell. Thanks for watching.